less stress, more time, more money. Welcome to the Cash Flow Contractor. Deep dive. Martin, how often do you spill your coffee? Never, never have. <laughs> I have a short memory. We didn't get it on video, but uh, got it on your phone, all over the table. I'd rather have it on video than on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> First well, time it ever happened, this morning anyway, so far. Yeah. Hey, you're uh, you're changing out your windows right now, right? Or is that uh, about to happen? It's pending. Pending? Yes. What are you waiting on? Um, them. But they're, they told us eight up. to 12 weeks, yeah. Eight to 12 so, weeks. Yeah. You must have found a really good contractor or everybody's replacing Incredibly your expensive. Yeah. Shockingly so. Shockingly but so. they're reassuringly expensive. Mm. What do you mean by that? I mean, you can get, I won't give exact numbers, but I'll give proportions, but I could get the windows done for ten to $12,000. And uh, the high end, I think, was thirty-five to $40,000. And we're kind of in the middle, but the ten to twelve thousand dollar guys, we didn't even have them come out. Just weren't even interested. No, that's it. it. I got an article on that, and it's in my book. It's called "Reassuringly Expensive," yeah. and uh, it's an important concept. Yeah, it's an important concept. Had that uh, come up yesterday? Who was that I was talking with? But when something is just surprisingly cheap, you're like, oh. I can't remember the guy's name, but some. PhD somewhere, uh, wrote a book and he said that everything's so complex nowadays that people use price as a substitute for judge, uh, for their judgment of quality. It doesn't yeah. mean that they just blow it off, but you immediately look, I buy a lot of hats, yeah. right? Never wear one, but I'll buy them. That's a really, I, I did not know that because I've never seen you in a hat. Oh yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> newsboy hats. That's what I wear. <laughs> anyway, you get a leather hat. And uh, it says fourteen dollars. You don't even click on it. You know, you right. get to ninety bucks up to one hundred fifty bucks. You're going okay. Yeah, it's a good hat. Yeah, it's just, yeah. You and I don't know. I'm looking at a picture. You know, all the pictures right. look good. But that concept of reassuringly expensive is uh, is very important. That comes from a uh, um, ad campaign by Stella Artois, the Belgian beer. Yep. And and people generally know exactly what it means. Anybody listening to me knows exactly what that means. Something's too good to be true. Yeah. It is. I'm trying to think of, you know, that, that contractor that bid your windows at 10 to 12,000. Yeah. Or the contractors, maybe. <clears throat> well, I didn't even give them a chance. Sure, they, sure. They said, oh, there'd be about X amount of hole, you know, X amount per window and, and then multiplication. I imagine if they are winning jobs, then they are probably not making much money. Um, margins are pretty low. Well, even if they have good margins, they've got low. Uh, yeah. revenue per job so they're exactly. not making as much and so i bet they want to change their reality uh, i don't know changing <laughs> windows to changing reality i was just trying yeah. to find a segue i know you did but hey, yeah, you know i'm sure they want to change their reality you know what segue where's that word come from it comes from motorized scooter with two wheels that you stand on uh that's segue. one of the places it went i'm just because kidding what is it what does it come from i mean it's, i know in spanish it's a it means oh, to follow. Right. You told me about this. Which I did. We've gone through this in an episode. People are bored oh. by your your oh. connections to history and... Uh, well, they're not going to like today. <laughs> um, we would have gone through the second. No, remember. I've got an article coming out. I'm going to record a, a short podcast today called The Sword of Damocles. Yeah. So, and it, it goes back 2,000 years. So if you don't like history and... Nah. I mean, the more things change, the more they're the same, guys. There's nothing new under the sun. That's Ecclesiastes. Yeah, it is Ecclesiastes. And there is nothing new under the sun. It's just a little faster nowadays. It is. It is. Well, I know that this is a really passionate topic of yours, as is for me, uh, changing your reality. It's more of a behavioral topic, and we haven't really covered any behavioral topics no. up to this point. Um, and so we're probably going to go long on this episode, I'm imagining, because there's so much to talk about. But um there's a lot of reasons people want to change their reality. You know, they're, they're maybe unhappy with the money they make. They're unhappy with how much stress they have. They're unhappy with the status they have. I mean, what are some of the reasons you've seen? Well, you're, you're hitting them, but I think the first thing is people are unhappy and it never can never 
really even occurs to them to change their reality. So that's the first step mm. is saying, hey, you know, I don't, do I want this for the rest of my life? Do I want this for the rest of my working life? Do I want to be doing this in 10 years? Or do I want something different? So it starts with a realization, hey, this is where I am and this is not good enough. Right. And a lot of people slog along every day, you know, Groundhog's Day, just get up in the morning, do the same thing, confront the same problems, mm -hmm. um, find some distraction in the evening and then go at it again. Yeah. And not everybody. I mean, life business isn't always torture. I realize when I write a lot about behavioral things mm -hmm. that I make it sound like business is torture. And a lot of it is not, but there is a lot of suffering that mm -hmm. goes on in business. And one of my, I mean, it's ours here too, but my particular in coaching is to eliminate suffering from business. Yeah. And so you have to acknowledge that there is suffering and then say, you know, I want something better than that. And that's the place to start. I think, I think a lot of people are subconsciously aware that they want to change their reality. I mean, as a marketer, that's what you're trying to hit on in your advertising campaigns, in your marketing. You're trying to get that emotion of, hey, we can change the status quo for you right now. You're unhappy. You're struggling with this. Buy this product and it's going to solve all your problems. Right. You're going to be happy if you have this one tool or whatever it is. And that's obviously not true. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've maybe bought something uh, or seen someone buy something because they thought it was going to change everything. And it just doesn't happen. I think a, a good example is with tools or softwares. The software companies do an excellent job of marketing how much easier they can make your life. And it's true. They can make your life. After you learn the software. You got to learn the software. You've got to <laughs> make it a habit of using the software. You have to be disciplined in your habits. And then you've got to scale that across your organization. Well, what happens when people buy software most of the time? They buy it, they use it for a week, and they don't touch it. But they signed up for an annual plan or for three years, and they've got to keep paying for it. Um, and their reality hasn't changed. And I think what we're going to talk about today is really that the tool isn't what changes your reality. It's how you use the tool, and it's how you use anything in life, right. how you approach life. And even, really even more... Reality. Low tech trap that a lot of contractors are caught in is chase the work, chase the work, chase the work, do yep. the work, do the work, do the work, chase the work. And it's yep. this up and down cycle all the time mm -hmm. that can be exhausting because you get so busy doing the work that you quit marketing, you quit selling, you quit bidding. And then you finish or come to the end of the work and realize you don't have any more work. <laughs> so then you got to go out and start selling and peddling and marketing and usually discounting to get to work because now you're out of work. Right. And so then you go into chasing the work and you're back into doing the work. And so that's, um, that's, a, I mean, there are lots of forms of realities, and lots of things to change, but that's one that's pretty common Absolutely, is chase, 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 do, 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 chase, 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 and never even it out. Yeah, absolutely. So if someone wants to change the reality, I think people are aware that they might be unhappy and it's not, a, it's not always a general unhappiness with your entire life, but it may be unhappy with a certain area, a certain aspect of something. Maybe it's a, a relationship. Maybe it's an aspect of your, an area of your business uh, or an employee uh, situation that you're in. There's unhappiness out there and there's realities that want to be changed. What's the first step in someone wanting to change the reality? Well, when I'm working with clients, there are two things. There has to be something they're unhappy with, the, the pain. Right. And or there has to be something that they want. So even if you're not, you know, excruciating pain, you envision something more that you want. Maybe it's an airplane. Maybe it's a vacation. Maybe it's a new house. Maybe it's just your time back. Maybe it's less stress. But those, the combination of those two things, something that's, that's bothering you, the pain that you want to get away from, something that you want for the future, which is the pleasure. Commonly, people say pain or pleasure, satisfaction, dissatisfaction. Yeah. But if... You are not unhappy with something. I mean, this is an observation of approaching 400 clients now and my own life. If you are not unhappy with something and or if you do not have an idea about what you want, you will not change mm -hmm. because you have to overcome. There's always resistance to change. And I like to ask people, what are, I'll just ask you, what are some reasons people resist change? Well, we're going to go through a lot of those. <laughs> Uh, well, those are kind of specific in the ones that I know we're going to go through. What in general, why in general, they're not wrong answers, but there are two that show up most of the time. They don't believe it's possible. They don't think the juice is worth the squeeze. 
Um, I mean, that's those are probably the most common that I think of uh, that come to mind of why people don't change the reality or they don't change from what's going on. They think it's too hard, but really for the most part, it's because they're not aware of it. Um, I think if they were aware that there were a better opportunity out there, if there was like a clear path, which is what most people want and it doesn't usually exist, people would do something about it. But I mean, you're right. It, it does take a, a pain or an awesome opportunity like right. the the pearl in the field uh, from from the Gospels. Um, the guy finds a pearl in a field and maybe it's not a pearl. I can't remember what it is, but finds a treasure in a field buries it and then sells everything he has to buy the field because he really <laughs> wants the treasure. I mean, it's, it's the same thing. Well, you're right on everything that you've just said, but more in more a general sense, I've talked to hundreds of people about this and we, they say it different ways, but their resistance to change usually comes down, in my opinion, to two things. One I call inertia. In other words, hey, I've always done it this way. It's easy. I, the software I've got is working. I know that could be a lot better, but oh my God, change. But inertia, I've always done it this way. It's habit. Yeah. I'm willing to change, but I'm going to change tomorrow. And as yeah. we've said before, tomorrow it's always today. It's never tomorrow. So inertia is one reason. Yeah. The other reason is fear. And I love to pursue that with people say, what are you scared of? Because in the United States, uh, you're not going to be killed by a lion when you walk out the door. So it's not that existential fear, I mean, really existential, then I'm going to die. Uh, you're not, if you get sick and um, something like that, you even if you don't have health insurance, you can still go to the hospital and might bankrupt you, but you're not going to die. And if, if you really think about it, most of the people who are listening have skills. Even if you fail in your business, you can go work for somebody else. Yep. And if you have the right mindset, which is the kind of thing we'll talk about here, you fail in the business, you go start another one. I'm reading a book right now about the uh, adoption of innovation. And the point is, the point in the book, it goes back to the 1700s. But the point in the book is everybody who accomplished anything failed multiple times. Oh, yeah. I mean, just, you know, me reading about it 300, 200 years later, you going, well, you know, of course, he made it through. Well, he wasn't thinking that <laughs> at the time or she. Yeah. So uh, the fear is... Not existential because you're not going to die when you, it's not that you will starve. Right. So what is it? And I had a new client yesterday and she uh, came up with the same thing everybody else did. Everybody else does. A lot of times fear is embarrassment. It's the opinion of others. I, I don't want to go broke. Yeah. And that's where I pull out Stephen Covey's uh, saying the 1640-60 rule, which a lot of people have heard of, more, more have yeah. not. But the 16, 40, 60 rule is that when you're 16, you're worried about what everybody thinks about you. When you're 40, you've learned to not give a damn what people think about you. And when you hit 60, you realize nobody's ever been thinking about you. So that fear of embarrassment is, uh, or fear of failure as an embarrassment is really just a false construct. It's in our own minds. Yeah. And so, but to take it back to the change formula is, um, still, even if it's just embarrassment, there has to be something sufficiently bad, 60 hour weeks, never enough money, something sufficiently bad you want away from it and an idea of how good things could be that you want to yeah. go to have to be greater than your, than your resistance. So you've said the change, you've mentioned the change formula and you basically just said it, but let's make it a little bit more clear. What is the actual change? The, formula? the change formula is pain times pleasure has to be greater than resistance. Okay. okay? And uh, you can have an emphasis on pain. You can have an, there are, there are people I know whose uh, impelling force is that they're suffering so badly. I'm sick of this. We've talked about it before. Disgust. Jim Rohn says disgust is a, is a, is a word that has a negative connotation to it, but it can be one of the most wonderful words oh, in the yeah. world. It brings you to action. I'm sick of this. I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bid that for what I think it's worth or go broke and I don't give a damn. Right. And that's when you finally find out, hey, they bought it. <laughs> I can actually do this job right. for the not $15,000 windows, the $25,000, $30,000 windows. Yeah. So that, the change formula has to be that. Pain times pleasure uh, have, times the good thing that you want.
has to be greater than your resistance to change. And when that happens, uh, wonderful things can happen. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, it's also really important for people to realize that they can't pawn their reality off on someone else. No. You can't say, or, and, or something else, it doesn't have to be someone else. It's, it's not someone else's fault. It's not the economy's fault. It's not coronavirus's fault, right? That, while those things may be valid, that, yeah, the coronavirus took out your restaurant because people weren't eating there and the government- But you know you how to run a restaurant. But you, but you can do something else. I, right. I think there's so many people out there right now that, uh, you know, not here in Oklahoma mainly, you know, there's some, but there's a lot of people in the U.S. that have lost their jobs because of COVID. You know, I, I hired two people that uh, lost their jobs, right. or job offers, I guess. Um, but there's, a, there's work out there. There's contractors that can't find people. You know, there's, there's so many businesses that are dying to hire people, but some people want to stay on unemployment. Some people don't want to leave their career. And if they would, we'll talk about this later, but if they would see these, you know, downfalls as detours, right? These changes as detours that can lead to a, a better road, uh, then they would have success. They would find, they would, their reality would change significantly and it would change for the better. Well, they're probably half the population. First, you're exactly right. Events happen, whether yeah. it's COVID, hailstorm, tornado, economic downturn, the 2008 recession, events happen. Yes. The outcome, the result has another factor and that's your response. Yeah. So the outcome is, is the uh, multiplication again, if you want to call it an equation of the event, your reaction to it equals the outcome. Yeah. I didn't come up with that. That's out there all over, but it's right. true. And a lot of people abdicate the second part. Mm -hmm. They say, well, I can't do anything. I'm helpless. I'm, and and to me, this isn't a political observation. It's just, and it's probably wrong, but it looks this way to me that about half the country is, is in that denial stage. It's not my fault. I can't do anything about it. It happened. The white guys got all the money or the 1% got all the money, or there's no opportunity for me because I came from a poor family uh, or, it's funny to me because I have had and have now a lot of clients who sell in the millions of dollars mm -hmm. and it will pop up repeatedly until I beat it down. Well, I don't have a college education. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what's that got to do with anything? You're selling millions. You go yeah. ahead, quit your business, go over and get a degree, come out with $35,000 in debt and a degree in some obscure subject that you can't yeah. sell. So, that kind of uh, mental baggage, yeah. you know, they went ahead and blew right through it. They said, this is what happened. This is what I'm going to do. And here's my outcome. Yeah. But they still kind of think they didn't do it the right way. And I said, well, no, the reality is you guys are doing great. Yeah. So, and, and as we discussed beforehand, the steps, I mean, we're talking about the change formula, which you have to look at and have to clearly define What's your pain? What's your pleasure? And why am I resisting it? So that you can make the changes. But to change your reality requires three things. First, you have to accept, just as we've been talking about, that it's up to you. It isn't any damn other person's fault. It's you. Yep. Wherever you're starting with whatever you got, do the best you can. And that's not saying that you may not. I mean, you could have had a really hard upbringing, terrible parents, awful community. You could have had some awful events and it's not discounting that, but the only thing that's actually going to change it is you. Yeah. I mean, if you've had bad events in your life, that's history. That's fact. There you go. Right. But and what are you going to do about it's it? It's still your responsibility. It's still your responsibility. So the number one thing when you, when you're looking to change your reality is accept that it's up to you. It isn't any damn other person or events responsibility or fault. Yeah. Accept that it's up to you. The second step is to decide. That's to decide what you want. That goes back to the change formula. It's mm -hmm. the pleasure or the vision part of the change formula. What do I want? Okay. Yeah. And what do I want to get away from? And then you have to take action. So if you sit around and you decide, okay, I'm responsible and this is what I want. And then you don't do anything. It's not going to happen. Not going to help. Right. So yeah. accept, decide and act is kind of the process. And I, I think something that people have to realize 
happiness is fleeting. Like you can be happy one moment and then you can be like Martin and spill your coffee all over your coffee all over the table. That made me happy. And, and be extremely upset. <laughs> but I think joy is a deeper state that is more, it's not fleeting. It lasts a lot longer. And I think for a lot of people, if they will accept responsibility, decide what they want and act on it, even if they don't reach their vision or the ultimate goal, as long as they just do those three things, they'll find joy. Yeah. And they may not be happy in some moments, but they're actually going to be more joyful. You're getting pretty, uh, pretty deep. Here. I'm, I'm, I'm you taking it to lot another of... level here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the, I, instead of joy, when I talk about people, it's totally valid, but I think of significance, uh, when Victor Frankl says, uh, in his book, the search for the meaning of life mm -hmm. a lot <laughs> in there, but you have to have a purpose. He, he was in a concentration camp in it's, World War II. That's II, a crazy and, story. And there were survivors and there were people. Matter of fact, he knew, uh, occasionally you could get cigarettes mm -hmm. at, in the camp and people always saved them for trading. But when he saw somebody smoking his cigarette, he knew they were done. And the reason was they were just having their last pleasure before they gave up. Mm -hmm. People who kept their cigarette were looking to the future. I'm going to need this. It's going to be transactional in the future. I might be able to bribe a guard or something like that. Yeah. But Frankel says that, and I think it's for him, but I like it. He says the meaning in life is serving other people. Yeah. When you have that, uh, you're, we are getting way out there, but, but the search for significance, you know, this might sound like a platitude, but there is no destination period. Well, today's death. destination. Yeah. There isn't any destination. There's right. the journey. Yeah. And the journey has to be fun because that's where you're going to spend your time, mm -hmm. fun or rewarding or whatever. Yeah. And I, I call it looking for significance mm -hmm. and making progress. I think this is true of, many more people than just me, but it's certainly true of me. If I'm learning things, if I'm making progress, if I'm experimenting, even if the experiment fails, mm -hmm. at least I've, I've learned that I tried, I just didn't sit around and complain. Yeah. And that, um, that constant learning and trying to gain significance is what's important, I think. Mm -hmm. And money can, is a substitute for significance. Mm -hmm. Uh, People who get a lot of money, maybe not the money itself, but it, money being the score and I won the game, you know, or right. I'm winning is significance. But the effort, uh, not not just accepting a fate and going home and yeah. sitting on your rear end and complaining, mm -hmm. that, that confers significance. So people who do try to change, do experiment, do improve, um, experience that significance, in my opinion, in my observation of lots of clients. Yeah, for sure. So, so let's talk about what makes up your reality. Okay. Um, we've discussed this in articles and I don't know that we've discussed on the podcast, but, um, your reality is made up of your beliefs, actions, and behaviors. Let's kind of dive deeper into that. What well, that's what, that? that's what people, people see. Um, uh, it's kind of an iceberg type principle. One eleventh of an iceberg is above the water and whatever 10 elevenths is below. I yeah. think that's actually the correct ratio. So what you see as your reality are, are, the, are the things that you do, the things that you believe, your opinions as you look around, what other people see, how you comport yourself and carry yourself. Yeah. That is your reality. And the first step, as we talked in the three, decide, act, and behave, is to yeah. take complete responsibility. Every one of us, I like to ask groups of people, I say, who in this room is supremely successful at life? <laughs> and I had a new client yesterday and I asked her that. She said, I am. I said, cool. See, nobody ever says that, <laughs> but it's the truth. Yeah. We are all 100% supremely immaculately successful at the life that we have built for ourselves based on our past actions and behaviors. Yeah. And so if we want to alter them, you first have to accept responsibility. It's up to you. You're not waiting for somebody else to do it for you. You have to accept it. And then you have to find a way to change your actions, your beliefs, and your behaviors. Mm -hmm. And again, as we talked to the first place to start is to be aware of them. Yeah. Second place is to be aware that you can change them and then act and do it. Right. And I mean, I, I think so much of the, I, I love the beliefs aspect of your reality because it's so shaped by like what you see, what, what you can 
think of in that moment. I mean, our, our reality is so different than people that are in, you know, the middle of a war or in a refugee camp. Or just other cultures. Or just other cultures. Yeah. The beliefs are so much different. Um, and it, it's really cool. You know, I coach soccer. I think I've mentioned that before on the show. But uh, I get to work with kids from different cultures. You know, we have kids whose families are Hispanic, families who are Asian, families who are white, uh, hot, you know, upper class, middle class, lower class. Um, so you see a lot of cultures and the beliefs people have about themselves going into practice every day. I mean, it shows and it often dictates the reality if they're going to be a starter or not. Right. Well, oftentimes is based on their beliefs about themselves. Right. I mean, I can think of three kids on the top of my mind right now that if they just believed in themselves a little bit more and believe that they had a chance to start, they would play probably... 50% to 100% more minutes than they currently right. play. But because they don't have that confidence, it it completely shapes the reality. Well, let, let's go back a little bit because we're talking about police. Uh, <clears throat> your actions, behaviors, and um, beliefs yeah. determine your reality. And if you want to, to uh, change that, mm -hmm. What can you do? And I tell people, if I'm a coach and I say, okay, you want something different, go change your actions, your beliefs, and behaviors. Right. Or action. Anyway, go, go change those. I'll see you next week. I haven't done a very good job because how the hell do you do that? Um, yeah. 90% of what we do is in our subconscious, more than that. 95% of our behaviors and actions and beliefs live in our, reside in our subconscious and we're not necessarily even aware of. Them. Yeah. Well, we're not aware of them unless they pop well above the surface and we get to see them and then they dive back down. So you have to be aware. You have to think about that. Right. So consciously there's one step before this, but consciously changing your behaviors, your actions and your reality. Uh, if I just told you to go do that, I wouldn't be doing you much of a favor. So I have to have some kind of an idea, uh, something that you can actually go do and concentrate on to begin to make the metamorphosis to change from wherever you are to where you want to be. Yeah, And above beliefs, I, want, I do want to dive into beliefs a little more, but above beliefs is skills. And the reason I say that it's, it's above, meaning it's easier to do, skills can be defined. Right. I ask people all the time, say, what skills would be useful in your business? And I hear things like, well, I'd like to understand more about finance. I'd like to understand more about selling. I'd like to understand more about time management. I'd like to understand more about uh, managing people, systems, people. processes. Yeah, systems. systems. Anyway, there are all these things. Yeah. And the neat thing about working on skills is that you can define it. Yep. I'm I'm going to learn about time management. Yeah. And this in this day and age, how are you going to do that? Podcasts, YouTube, webinars, ebooks, book books, classes at the community college, coaches. I mean, you're just not infinite, but damn near infinite right. things for nothing, for free. For free. So they say, okay, my, my most, and we'll talk about your one thing at the very end, but let's just say that when I really analyze why I'm not doing well, it's my time management skills. I am messing up. I'm over here and I'm over there and then I accept another one and I don't get back to the first two and they're mad at me and I'm going crazy and, and it's time management. You might decide that. Well, if you imagined a year, as being a continuum because it is. Yeah. And you said, okay, three months out of this year, first quarter, all these other things are going on, but I'm going to watch 15 YouTube videos, buy one ebook, go to a webinar, yep. uh, find a coach and go to a mastermind and learn about time management for three months, the first quarter of the year. You'll be an expert at time management. Well, and even, even if you're not, you, you can write a PhD on it, but you're going to know a lot more than you did when you started. You're going to be able to act. You're going to be able to act. Yeah. And then you say, what's the next thing? Well, if they're talking to me, it's always going to be about books, right? Books and finances. Yeah. Well, I don't understand anything about that. Huh. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. You're going to buy Martin Holland's book, The Profit Problem. They say I make money, so I don't have any, <laughs> and read it. No, you can, you can do the same thing. YouTube, you don't need to become an accountant, but what can I learn about this? And there's some simple things to learn. So mm -hmm. for the first three months, you did time management. For the second three months, use part of the time that you're managing to learn about bookkeeping. For the next three months, you say, what can I learn about marketing? I'm not going to be a marketer, but what principles can I learn? Yeah. And then the fourth, I don't know, throw me out another one, how to write a system. Well, at the end of a year, 
because you because of skills and paying attention, you are a different person. You know something about time management, you know something about organization, you know something about books, you know something about marketing. And it never stops. Nope. Never stops. You always have to be learning. Right. There's just no greater crime to yourself than to be just as ignorant. And that's not an insult. That that just means I don't know. To be just as ignorant a year now from now as you are today on an important topic. That's 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 where you're going astray. Yeah. And sometimes we get held in that ignorance because, well, I don't know. And, uh, oh, I'm, I never went to college. What am I going to learn about accounting? Well, go find out. And then, and your pride grows, your confidence grows, your business grows all with this continuum yeah. of learning. So I think skills going back, is the first thing to look at. Absolutely. Going back to our first topic with your windows and the, all the different quotes you got, if, if you're that, you know, 10 to $12,000 guy and you want to change your reality, if you change some of the skills you have, maybe you're good at windows, but you probably have some thoughts, beliefs that you aren't good at windows. So if you went and did some skill training and went to different vendors and took their workshops and, um, you know, watch more videos on different types of windows and, you know, selling skills right. on selling as well and estimating and all these different areas, uh, that you can grow in your skills it's going to shape your beliefs, right? You're going to feel better, exactly. which goes into the next thing, which we were talking about is the beliefs. Yeah. Beliefs, as we've said, as I already said, our beliefs, here's how I define a belief. It's what we believe to be true based on the evidence we've gathered so far. Okay. Okay. That doesn't mean that there aren't things that are true in the world, mm -hmm. you know, facts, but here's an example. When I speak to groups, I like to ask them to describe a salesman. That's occasionally, right. including <laughs> yesterday with that new client, she said, teacher, help me, you know, all these good things. I said, no, you're ruining my speech. <laughs> when I ask a group, always they say sleazy, liar, pushy, obnoxious, car salesman, all these negative things yeah. about a salesman. Occasionally, like yesterday, they don't, but that's just almost universal. I say, okay. How many do you want would like to be a salesman? And they don't like it. Or they don't like selling, especially cold calling. Yeah. And the it's obvious. If you think that salesmen are liars, cheaters, snake, oil salesmen, of course you don't want to be a salesman. Mm -hmm. Who wants to be included among the sleazy liars of the world? Nobody. But then we push a little bit and say, well, is that true? Is every salesperson? Is every And they always, we all have salespeople in our lives. I remember selling a deal one time to a, to an oil company in Oklahoma here. And I was up there on a Saturday and we were working on a project and they said, well, we don't like salesmen to come in here on our, on our weekend times. So I said, well, I'm a salesman. You know, I said, well, I'm here. And they go, well, you're not a salesman. <laughs> what, what do you think, do you I, think am? I am? <laughs> and uh, a friend. so everybody, if they start thinking about it, have helpmates who wind up, wound up selling them something, but they told you about a new product or they, you know, Paralam beams or quick drying concrete or new innovation. Somebody makes that known to you or equipment yeah. salesman who shows you a new piece of equipment. Well, those people are educated. Oh, well maybe salesmen aren't all sleazy, mm -hmm. right? So you have examining your beliefs and ask, especially the negative. I say, if you believe something is, and it's really good and it's serving you well, don't examine it. Just accept it. Yeah. But if you have a negative belief or something that's holding you back, look at it and say, is that true? Such as I didn't go to college. I mean, I hear, as I all said, I hear it all the time. I didn't go to college. Who cares? Well, what the, what the hell's I got to do with anything? Oh yeah. Well, I feel kind of bad about it. And well, why? And then you ex go in there and find that, take that lid off. There are people walking around who think they're, they are 30,000 heirs. In other words, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm worth 30,000 bucks. Yep. That's $15 now. Yep. And then there are people who say, you know, and mentally think, man, if I could get to a hundred, hundred thousand dollars a year, that'd be pretty good. You know, do you really think you can do it? Yeah. Well, I can tell in their eyes whether they really think they can or not. I was, uh, working with a salesman for a client of mine and, trying to get his goals and his purpose, his right. belief, and kind of talking about all these things we're talking about today. And I said, well, can you make 75,000? It's a sales position. Can you make 75,000? He goes, oh yeah. I said, can you make a hundred? He goes, yeah. 
I said, can you make 150? And he goes, yeah. I said, can you make 200,000? Which you can't. Could. And he said, yeah. And I said, come on, where did I lose you? He goes, 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's saying yes to me because he thinks he's supposed to. But his brain cut off. He couldn't imagine making more than 100. Yeah. If you can't imagine it, it's not going to happen. If you, There are other people. There are those, I was describing the low end. There are other people who are walking around and they're millionaires, but they don't have a pot, right? Without finishing the saying. Yeah. But they will. Oh, yeah, I'm a millionaire. I still don't have it yet. But I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Well, first of all, they're having some joy, as you describe it, in the world yeah. right now because they're just, oh, maybe that million's around behind that tree, yeah. you know? Or when I get this invention done and I'm still working on it, I'm on the 20th innovation. But they just think they are millionaires. So it's worthwhile because your beliefs, I have a, a picture on my presentation I give on this subject and it's a mule. People might have seen it asleep and he's tethered to one of those cheap eight ounce PVC chairs and he's just tethered in the street standing there. And I ask people what's holding him back and not very many of them mentioned the chair because it's obviously not. If he sneezed it, flip it over his head. <laughs> it's his brain holding him back. Right. And that is, I, I wish people could all see that picture and just completely carry it in their minds at all times because it, and mine included, it is our brains that hold us back. It's our beliefs. Mm -hmm. We don't believe we can really do that. So working with people and, and for people listening, examine what, where are you on the continuum? What do you really believe you could do? Yeah. 30,000, 50,000 uh, net, net profit and income to you. Now I'm not talking about sales. 100,000, 250, 500, a million. What do you think? Well, everybody listening, maybe I haven't hit it. Let's say 10 million and 20 million. So we catch everybody. You dropped off somewhere. Yeah. And why is that? And so your beliefs, uh, they're like, they, they started somewhere, uh, some event. Uh, I have a story in my book about a, our sales manager from one of my companies about three companies ago down in Florida, uh, Georgia, and he wasn't doing well. And I went down to see why. And it was in the office when he got a phone call from a customer. We sold to cities and mm -hmm. municipalities and counties and so on. And the guy's name was Frank. And as he picked up the phone, he said, hey, Bob, you know, thanks for calling me. I've got numbers for you. Meaning he was presenting a bit. And I was just listening. He, and he, then he said, are you sitting down? He said that to the customer. Mm -hmm. Are you sitting down? I about exploded. I was furious because he planted the idea. And then he prattled on and on and on and on and explained why the bid was so high because, well, we have to go under here, you know, all this. It was about one fifth of our average sale. And, but Hank or Frank thought it was a lot of money. And it showed. Mm -hmm. And his belief that it was a lot of money led to the comments, are you sitting down? I mean, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to tell some, give somebody a bid and say, boy, sit down now. I'm going to give you the numbers. Well, what you just teed him up for a holy cow, what's coming at me? Yeah. And his beliefs that the amount of money of that bid was a lot of money came from his upbringing and it wound up like expressing itself in comments such as, are you sitting down? Which lost us the sale. And I fired Hank. I mean, right. I worked with him a little bit, but he, he just, he was arguing with me about how much money that was. I, it's not, you just think it is. Well, his beliefs came from his upbringing mm -hmm. and they could easily like, like the layers of an onion, you can peel them back and say, you know, it's 10,000, a lot of money to a city because yeah. that's the price of the job. It's pocket change. And are we delivering a benefit that's worth more than 10,000? Absolutely. But he thought 10,000 was a lot of money. It freaked him out, cost him his job, which I am absolutely certain reinforced his belief that money is the root of all evil. And that, you know, that's why, you know, that could have changed his reality. Well, I haven't seen him since, so <laughs> I don't know, but could it could have been the thing that sparked the change. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, it's honestly, it could have been painful enough for him to realize, wow. I from, gotta from him arguing with me. Didn't sound and, like it. Yeah. It didn't sound like it. And so, so our values are also something that we can change to change our reality, but this isn't something that's an easy change skills. Obviously you can go and learn a skill. You just need time, energy, motivation to go and learn right. the skills. 
beliefs. If you gather enough evidence, you can change the beliefs. Right. Um, and, and that can happen. It's a little bit easier, but values, I tell people all the time, you can't just write down your values. You have to look at where you actually spend your time, where you spend your money, where you spend your energy, what you pay attention to. That's what shapes your values. Yeah, we, I think to define values as the things you stand for. And he yeah. said more easily understood, it's the thing, it identifies the things you won't stand for. So, sure, sure. and they can change, as you pointed out. And the example I like to use is you have a young married couple who's doing both professionals. They're making some money, driving a Range Rover, running around, doing all the hip stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's their value. Nothing wrong with that. But that's their values is social and, and uh, you know, well, that's just their value set. Yeah. Then they have a baby. <laughs> okay. Like five years later, they're driving a van and right. they're going to soccer. And they're hanging out with cussing Khalil because he won't pay, play their kid long enough, you know. Um, right. So your values can change. But I don't know where values come from, if they're uh, from your parents or God-given or whatever. But values really do, they are who you are. And I, I like to say this, you can identify your values because when you, viol when you violate your values, it's like stabbing right. you in the heart. You can't stand it. I'll just say, if you lie. Yeah. If you don't care about lying, if your values are, I don't place, I don't highly value trust and betray, you know, I don't, uh, issue betrayal. Sure. And you lie to get where you want and it doesn't bother you. That's not your values. But if you, I mean, I've got some things I've done in my past that you, I will never discuss with anybody. Sure. But there were violations of my value and it was like, Oh my God, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. And you don't just get over it tomorrow morning. Sure. It takes time to get over it, but it's a lesson learned. And one of the most important things about values is that you understand what yours are. You, you said you can't just write them down. You, you can write them down after you've observed them. Right. You have to observe <laughs> them. If you pay attention. And the most important thing about values and changing the reality is that you need to know what yours are. Yeah. And do things that align with those values. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if somebody wants you to do crooked bidding, something like that, you're not going to do it. Right. If your value is, if you value money more than you value uh, the pride of workmanship or your reputation, it'll show. It'll show. If you value your reputation more than you value money, that'll show as well. And probably you'll wind up with more money. Not probably, you will. Yeah. But. That's the first thing is that you behave in accordance with your own values. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need to know what they are. The second thing is in your role as the boss of your company, you need to accumulate people with values similar to yours. The, there are lots of reasons companies go broke and go out of business. Probably the number one reason is cultural conflict. In other words, you wind up with people working for you who don't show up, they don't care, they subterfuge, they steal from you, they wreck your vehicle, you know, just, they're just, they're disruptive, they gossip, they cause trouble amongst mm -hmm. your people, your team, and you just can't tolerate that. So you yeah. have to know what your values are. You have to learn to see them in the people that you bring in to work with you. Right. And you don't bring in people whose values don't align. I got story after story. Yeah, I think, I mean, knowing your values and sticking to your values with hiring. Right. I mean, is the difference between hiring an asset versus hiring a liability right. for your company. Um, and it, it starts with you knowing them yourself. And it's, it's why, like, we spend time with people really sorting out what are your values, identifying the core values, making them really easy to remember, easy for people to see. Um, people know your values if they spend enough time with you. But it helps bring clarity if they can see them written down, if they right. can see them, you know, demonstrated uh, on paper, but also in person. And one thing about that, writing them down, if you put down a bunch of platitudes because you need something to put on your website, They're invisible. it's a crock. Yeah. The uh, Netflix has a uh, slide deck. It's yeah. famous. The Netflix it's culture. culture. Yeah. And uh, if anybody emailed, I'd send it to them. Uh, but it's. One of the points that they make is pride, integrity, and honesty, something like that, these three. And they're over the shoulder of Ken Lay when they're when he's coming out of his office. That's uh, Enron. 
Oh, Enron. Yeah, he was the CEO of Enron, and and they're bringing him out in handcuffs and right over his shoulder are their those <laughs> values, right? So people, they're, they're platitudes. They have to be real, mm-hmm. and you can write them down, and you should write them down, but you have to live them, and right. you have to not tolerate people who violate them. Right. So, and uh, more importantly, you also have to celebrate them whenever right. they are lived out. Like, your employees need to know. Yeah, and I'm, we're kind of going off on the on the. Well, no, here, but it's no, we're, we're talking about changing your reality, which means changing your beliefs, actions, and your behaviors. And th- these are steps. Steps. Skills is sure. the easy one because you can just do it right now. You, as soon as you're through listening to us, you can Google or keep uh, listening to us. We have a lot right. of things that'll help you go your skills. Right, right. <laughs> that's that's part of it. But I mean, you can you can do that. Your beliefs. You have to be aware next time you're thinking something negative or something. I mean, I just know people who just, it's negative out of their mouths all the time. Yeah. And I'm not a touchy feely guy, but I'm just going, you say that all the time. Is that true? Uh, I'll give you an example. We're yeah. back on beliefs. Sorry, but I have groups of people and I'm thinking of one and I had a mastermind and a guy in the back said, we just can't hire good people anymore. <laughs> and I looked around the room and I said, okay, is that true? Anybody in here? Hired good people in the last, let's say, three months, six months, and more than half the hands went up. I said, so you can hire good people. You just haven't done it yet. Yeah. And my point wasn't to embarrass the guy, but it was to say, if you think you can't hire good people, you're going to take the first heartbeat that walks in the door. If you know that you can hire good people, you have to find out what you have to do to do that. If you're paying eight bucks an hour and good people are out there working for 20 bucks an hour, Probably not. You probably can't hire good people for free, but you can do what's necessary, but you have to believe you can. And so that accumulation of knowledge, skills, beliefs, such as that, understanding your uh, values can change your reality. They do change your action behaviors and beliefs because now you understand you're not self-deselecting. Yeah, absolutely. So, I'm a firm believer that your values make up your identity, mm-hmm. um, which is the next thing that you can change, which is even harder to change than your values uh, because you have to change your values first and then your identity changes. Well, and not necess- not always like that. Yeah, I think, I think your values can be solid, but you have to change your beliefs. Your identity is a special subset of beliefs. It's how do you fill out this sentence? I am a... Blank, Blank, right? And that's like reminds me of the old Saturday Night Live deal. Like, doggone it, I'm Al Franken. That's probably Mm -hmm. too old for a lot of people. I kind of viewed that as touchy feely stuff, but it's not. It's not. It's if you say, I am a contractor, I am proud of it, I am going to grow, I am a learning machine, that's a positive thing. Or you say, I'm a loser, I'm just a little guy, I always lose these jobs, I need to bid cheaper to get them. Those two identities I'm, yeah. I'm a loser i'm just a little guy well people are hopefully walking around thinking i'm a loser but i'm just a little guy yeah my, versus my, i'm a big guy but i just happen to be little right now <laughs> what do i right. need to do to get bigger so how you and then your values come with that i mean and they can be modified by some of that but it's it's a subset of beliefs there's a book called un f yourself only it's not <laughs> f you know what it is right by gary john bishop Bought that book because I was exploring these ideas of touchy feely stuff. Yeah. And he, it turns out it's a pretty substantial book. He points out in there that people have over 50,000 thoughts a day. And majority are negative. And, well, and every one of them is a conversation with yourself mm-hmm. and pay attention to what you're saying. Yep. And that's, that's an exercise because oh, yeah. you're just having that conversation at the stoplight thinking about whatever you're thinking about. Wait a minute. What am I saying? Why did I say that? Why? It, it, it's hard for a lot of people, me included, to just force yourself to think positive all the time because I'm not positive all the time. I, a really good analogy of it is, you know, negative thoughts are like weeds and positive thoughts are like the, the grass on a golf green. Right. I mean, you're if you want to have a nice grass like putting green, then you've got to take literally every single day to make sure it stays that to way. To cultivate it. To cultivate it, to keep it there, to make sure it stays nice and neat and clean and soft and smooth. Um, but if you want to grow weeds, just don't do anything. 
right? I mean, same thing with negative thoughts. If you don't do anything, those negative thoughts are just going to cultivate. The weeds will, and weeds will grow. take the garden. They'll become, you know, really tall trees that, you know, are, are bad. But if you want positive thoughts, you've got to work on it every single day. And it'll really define who you are. I think another thing with identity that I like to, to talk about is that your identity should shape what you do, not what you do shape your identity. Right. And a lot of people get that wrong, especially you know, I, I talk about the, the kids that I hang out with and uh, that I coach and people that I see in college. I even look back at myself. I'm still pretty young and um, they're so focused on what do I do next? You know, do I take this job? Do I try to, you know, move to this city? Do I uh, study this? Uh, they're so worried about what do I do? And if they would focus a little bit more on who they are, they would have a lot more clarity on what to do. Uh, but they're so focused on what they do, it, they allow that to define them. And the same thing happens for, for anyone, contractors included. You get so focused on what you do and, you know, oh, I need to win this job. I need to win this job. I got to be the low bid, whatever it is. You're so focused on what you do. And that ends up defining who you are. You're now the low bid contractor who is always struggling for money, always stressed out. And it, it, it's backwards. They need right. to focus on, hey, I'm a good contractor. I do great work. I've got good margins and people pay me fairly like, because I'm good at what I do. So now this is that reflects on my bids. Right. So you have to start with your identity, not with your actions. And Brian Tracy has another quote, act as if. Yep. And it's a better way of saying fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. But if you begin to, to believe, if you begin to have confidence, if you begin to say to yourself, I'm, I'm good at this. Yeah. You might not even believe it, <laughs> but it's the act as if, and he, he calls it one of his laws. It's been a while since I read it, but if you act as if it will soon become reality uh, and it's the fake it till you make it. Yeah. It's kind of hard, but just, even if you don't really believe you're a successful contractor, but you force yourself to tell you, tell yourself that you are and then act that way. Um, and, and that, it will I become think the, reality. The important thing there is act, mm -hmm. not say as if, but act as if right. it's not, it's not, um, you know, going back to values, it's not just saying that health is one of your values, but you're sitting there ordering dominoes every single day and getting Cokes at the 7-Eleven and haven't jumped on the treadmill or gone for a workout in months. That is just saying as if, right. but act as if, actually go and do it. You know, right. if you, I mean, go, if health is going to be your value, then, Hey, I'm going to act as if, right. Yeah. And and it, been, it, for, a, for a contractor that act as if might. Uh, manifest itself as adding 10% to a bid yep. and walking in. There's another saying, I don't know who said it, but people will generally accept you at your assessment of yourself until you prove them otherwise. Yep. But if you walk in with your chin up mm -hmm. and confident and can explain your project to the homeowner, if yep. you're talking at that level and present your price, they will look at you and go, well, okay. All right, let's do it. Right. If you walk in there like Frank did yeah. uh, and said, are you sitting down? I know, I know you guys, uh, you know, I know you were thinking of a $40,000 project and, and I'm in at 45,000, you know, no, yeah. you walk in and go, he can, look, 40 will get you this, but a hundred will get you this. And you're going to really like this hundred. Yeah. Well, yeah, you maybe you're right. So act as if. Act as if for sure. And sometimes that means not just changing your bid, but. Hey, I, I'm doing residential. I want to do commercial. Right. Act as if. Hey, I want to get into this industry and get these types of jobs. Act as if. Um, and and follow it up with good actions, with diligence, with good work, hard work. Yeah, I found a poem that, in looking through some material for this today, I found a poem that I'd found a long time ago by a guy named Jesse Rittenhouse. And I don't know who that is, but I like his poem. And it was... He says, uh, I bargained with life for a penny and life would pay no more. However, I begged at evening when I counted my scanty store for life is just an employer. He gives you what you ask. But once you've set the wages, you must bear the task. I worked for a menial's hire only to learn dismayed that any wage I had asked of life, life would willingly have paid. I just thought that's great. Really, should we give snaps? Is that what they do with poetry? Uh, well, I can't snap with my right thumb. Right oh, now. you stubbed your thumb. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I had a little accident. Can't use my right thumb right now. But fortunately, I'm not swinging a hammer. Yeah.
No, that's that's really good. I, I think that's yeah. Very I like powerful. That. whatever price wage I'd asked of life, life would willingly have paid. Yeah, and that's that's true. It's very that's true. true. Very true. So um, we're we're talking along the lines of your reality or your beliefs, actions, and behaviors. You talked about skills changing at beliefs, values, and identity. And there's there's your perception of your identity. There's there's one more kind of before we move on, and that's your environment. Yeah. And uh, this is straight Jim Rohn. I mean, I love the guy. But one of the greatest examples of the environment right now is whichever TV shows you listen to, Fox or CNN or MBC, MSNBC or whatever side of the political divide you're on, you start watching that stuff, or at least I did. Uh, I've been active in political stuff for a long time. Yeah. But you start watching that, and by 6 in the morning, the veins are bugging out on my temples <laughs> and my neck, and I walk to the office, I'm already pre pissed off yeah. and I turn the lock and I'm trying to research. I've even spent time researching rebuttals to stupid things I heard, you know, sitting in my office. What am I doing? Yeah. My environment. And so is yours, Mr. or Mrs. Listener. Yeah. Is, is just, there's poison floating around. And uh, Darren Hardy in his book, uh, The Compound Effect, yeah. has a great solution. And that's a great book too. Darren Hardy, The Compound Effect. He said, turn the damn TV off. Just turn it off. Turn it off. And I used to think, well, I can't really do that because responsible citizens need to be informed. And, and I do believe that. But I don't need to listen to 24. I've, I've turned it off for a week, turned it back on. And I heard the same. I couldn't tell you a word in the sentence that was different. Yeah. You know, talking about whether it's right. Russians or, or something Trump did or. I said, well, yeah, I didn't really miss anything. No. Nope. Except I missed the blood pressure spikes. <laughs> so. That's one way that, that, that's an example of how your environment um, affects you. Yeah. More specifically, there's a stat out there, a statistic out there that says we make plus or minus 10% of the five people we hang around with. Most. Absolutely. Okay? Uh, that's not true of me. I got some friends, I don't make 5% of what they do. But anyway, <laughs> they let me hang around. But why would that be? And the answer to that is you tend to do the things they do, to listen to what they listen to. When the conversations are going on, you just kind of, you know, you can find yourself pulled way right or way left or way up or way down just by incrementally listening to a conversation. Well, people like minded people take it off. You don't hear. Yeah. Anyway, it, it's, it's really obvious yeah. why you tend to make the people you hang around. If, if there is in my case, um, do better than I, at least yeah. monetarily. I'm a benefit by hanging around them. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they benefit from actually. I think they do, but <laughs> that's a little cocky, but I think it's true because otherwise I wouldn't be hanging around. Yeah. But pay attention to who you're hanging around with. Pay attention to what you read. Pay, mm -hmm. pay attention to who you listen to. And if they're taking you away, if they're not benefiting your reality, get rid of them. And as Jim Rohn says, there are some people that you can be around every day. Mm -hmm. There are some people you can see maybe once a week. Yeah. Some people you can see at Thanksgiving, Christmas and, you know, family get togethers and there are other people you just need to get shut up. Just get away from them yeah. because they're poisoning you. So if you look at those things, skills, which you can go out and look at beliefs, which, which is a continuing evolution, well, so is skills, but of examining what you think and why you think that and challenging if it's negative. Why is that really true? Right. Um, the values, which you need to know so you can match them, your identity, what you think of yourself. That's, yeah. that's just the most important. Really what is. you think of yourself, that mule tied to a chair <laughs> by entirely by his brain and in your environment. Those are things that you can actually do today. Mm -hmm. I mean, start thinking about all those things and over a very small period of time and drive a stake. And yeah. by that, I mean, Get some measurement or assessment of where you are today, because in a year, you're going to be a completely different person, but it will have happened gradually, right. and you won't recognize the changes that you made. Absolutely. I think you know something that we haven't mentioned with a lot of this is, and we, we mentioned it a little bit on the value side, but uh, there's a reality for your company, not just for yourself. And the environment at your company, the culture at your company, Absolutely. it makes a huge difference. And that's why, you know, we, we mentioned the values, but if you bring in one, one person that is a liability, not an asset, 
and they don't fit the culture and they bring down the environment. The environment changes for everybody. Oh, and I, that is so true. You have to protect your culture. Uh, I can go, we, we can go two more episodes. We've just had on an this episode subject. on culture. It matters. And if you have to choose the right people and also you need to choose, people want to hire a heartbeat or they want to hire people that are uh, low wage. I mean, it can be that's your, your you're value system. negative you, investment. Right. You you're want to it. save that money more than you see the value. That, you, that's, you have, I mean, it, you might find the, the up and comer who's going to be great one day and you're able to pay them lower. And that's by great. Luck. <laughs> you know, that happens. Um, but be on a path to, to raise their wages if that's what you found. Because if you can find people that want up you, then you've just, you've made your environment better. Right. And, and you have to continue thinking along those lines of how can we continue to grow our culture, make this environment a better workplace that's going to raise the value of our our product, our service, of our uh, our value to our employees, to our clients, our customers. There's a there is an example worth bringing up be, comes to mind because it happened on Tuesday. I have a client who has a sales lady who is pretty good. She sells about a million and a half a year of yep. their product, but she is obviously it's about her. It's not the company. Right. And some things have happened that we have to make a decision. Nobody knows who I'm talking about. And so, but we the real concern here is her values and her loyalties lie with her. Now there's nothing wrong. People come to work for you and yeah. They're there to make a living, but they're part of the team. Be, yeah. We have team goals and all this, and she's not that person. Yeah. And it's starting to cause problems. And so the owner and I were talking in, it hasn't happened yet, but where we are is she's going to be gone. Right. And you want to talk about kill you. Yeah. There's a million, a million and a half. Sales. That's about 25% of their sales right now. Yeah. Going to walk out the door. And it's a kind of a business where the salesman owns the customer. Mm-hmm. Um, it just kind of is one of those, you know, you can yeah. do something about that, but she is all about her and thinks that what the good things that happen to the company are unfair. And yeah, and it's, it's damaging. Mm-hmm. And we had this exact topic. Yeah. It, it takes real courage to fire 25% of your sales. Yeah. And we really, that's the decision we reached. It, it's so, it's so interesting um, because a lot of what we do for clients is branding and, a lot of this falls into branding. We define your values so that you can have a better environment so that you feel better about who you are. And it's clear you have clarity on who you are and you can act out of that. Um, and then we bring those values to life inside of your messaging, inside of your design. Uh, and you see that in places like your website and on your social media accounts and the collateral that you use for sales. And so it starts with all these things. And I, I mean, just seeing the look on people's faces that are employees and that are the owners of companies when they feel like all of this is really clear. Oh my gosh, the confidence that exudes, the the clarity that exudes from these people is, and it's one of the best feelings that we can have of when we see people like, man, I feel good about who I am and I feel clear about what we're doing and who we are and where we're going. It's, it's amazing. And so, um, it's, it applies to the company, but it, and it applies to the person, and they're very intertwined. And it's really important to understand these things, especially if you're going to change re- your reality. Um, so I've been looking forward to this segment. I haven't really talked a lot. Whole, uh, so, so I haven't talked a lot so far, but uh, we've got 10 lies that people believe about changing their reality. And we're just going to kind of walk through them. Um, first one is... I don't have time to change my reality. I'm so covered up right now. There's no way that I can do it. Manana. I'll do it tomorrow. Well, yeah, we've got, got that one on here yeah. too. <laughs> but I think, you know, my, my point with this is you don't have time not to get started. Every day that you are living in a reality that's not ideal for you, for your company, for your employees, is a day wasted and a day going not just wasted but in the wrong direction. And you've got to make up that ground again later on. It's it's like you're moving backwards and you're saying, yeah, we don't have time to go forwards. <laughs> Stop everything and go forward. Like there, you don't have time to not get started. Um, 
it's and going on to the next point that I'll change it later uh, is is the next slide. It's like, oh, we'll have time later that we can do it. Um, that's that's also not true. There's the French saying, plus tard, c'est trop tard. Oh, come on, man. You're yeah. using France. We haven't been doing French. We haven't. Oh, yeah, we French. did. Argo. That's a French word. Oh, gosh. But So what's that mean? It, it means that, um, you know, later is too late, right? And it's just because something, the, the, the lie that people get into is that just because they think, oh, when, when this season's over, We'll get started. I don't know how many times I've heard that from a contractor. It's our busy season. We'll we'll work on our systems whenever that's done. We'll work on our marketing whenever that's done. Um, it's it's such a lie. Just because something ends does not mean that something has started. Mm-hmm. People do it in life too. Like, oh, whenever I'm done with this, I'm going to start working out again, or I'm going to start eating healthy. And the 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 issue is they're not seeing it as an identity issue. They're seeing it as a seasonal time issue, but it really has to do with your identity. The reason why you're not working out is because you haven't made it a part of who you are and right. your values. Right. The reason why you haven't gotten your systems down is because you haven't, your company hasn't valued that and you haven't made, a, made it a priority. It has nothing to do with time. And great. the reason they haven't made it a priority or value it is the pain or pleasure. They there don't have a compelling, passionate vision for the future or pain that they're going to get away from. And I, I think that sometimes it's, they don't realize the pain that they're actually in. They're, they're not yeah. aware that something, oh. some, some event. I have a, I have a client who has some serious cash flow issues and the bank said, we need good finances. And the accountant said, Nope, I'm not signing off on these because they're junk. Well, it's been years of saying you need to get your books right and now. So they're scrambling. Yeah. They're scrambling, but an event, a crisis, yep. could have been doing it right all along. Absolutely. Well, and I think that's why you, I know you are huge on getting books in order. And I think that's an awareness moment. Like they see the books and like, oh, right. this has been bad why do for I, a Why long do I time. need those? And yeah, yeah, I know kind of, but yeah. uh, you know, it's not worth it. I'm busy today. Yeah. So, so lie number one, I don't have time. Lie number two, I'll change it later. It'll, it'll change later. I'll change the reality whenever I have time for yeah. it. Um, line number two, I don't have the skills. We've talked a lot about skills and we've talked about fake it till you make it act as if the reality is all the people that you look up to all me and Martin included in this podcast, you may think, man, they've got their stuff together. You mean I, that they think that of us? Maybe they don't, but oh, I've heard, I've heard send it from your people emails like, hey, you guys are great. The so we can put is, them in the uh, show notes, and, you know, <laughs> reviews. Everyone's making it up as they go. If, and if they if they say they're not, then maybe they've already had experience, for example, making the podcast in the past, so they kind of know, but they're still making it up as they go. And everybody at one point was making it up as they went. Um, and at one point, we didn't know what we know now. You've gotten better because you've learned something and you're going to learn something in the future that's going to make you better. And yeah, you don't have the skills now. You're not supposed to, but you've got to just do and learn from it. Do and learn from it. Take action. That's the best source of learning. Don't sit here and just watch videos all day and say, oh, now I know how to do it. No, go and do it, right? Act. Watch the videos so you no, got an watch idea. The then go too, do yeah. But don't just do that. Go and act. Go and do something right. different. That's going to be your best teacher. And then if you really want to learn, we'll talk about this in a little bit, also reflect on what you just did. You just did this new job that you've never done before, whatever it was. Reflect on it. What did I learn from this? What 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 could have been better next time? Right? What were the biggest takeaways? What were the highlights? What were the terrible things? What do I not want to do in the future? If you don't take time to reflect, you don't have nearly the, the same amount of learning. Right? But if you t- if you actually go and do it and then you reflect on it, you're gonna learn. Those skills will get out of the, those skills that you didn't have will become skills that you do have. And then if you if you want to have high, high retention of those skills, teach someone else. It'll build systems in your business. It'll make you better and your process more refined. Um, But those are, those are huge things that people say, Oh, I don't have the skills to do it. And I hate that. Go default to action and go do something. Um, Another one that we hear about here often is there's not the opportunity. I don't have the, there's not a market for it or I don't have the opportunities. You ever hear that? Yeah. Yeah. On occasion. On occasion. All the time. 
one of my favorite books, I, I think I've mentioned it in previous episodes, but it's uh, Range by David Epstein. And he just talks about how generalists are going to rule the world, that specialists, their jobs eventually will be able to be automated. Uh, and the, the thing that can't be automated very well is critical thinking, is experiential thinking, pulling from one experience, moving to the next and putting into the next. And he talks, he has so many stories in there. It's a great book, but uh, one of them is Nintendo. And they were actually a Japanese card company. They made uh, like playing cards. It was oh, for really? a specific game uh, in, in Japan, not the playing cards we use today, but playing cards is what they did. And they would use lateral thinking to move into different areas. And it was really because of this one guy, I think it was Yokoi is his name. Um, but he didn't get any of the great internships in college for the big, like Sony, uh, the, these big companies that were really innovative and in, in doing big things, which even Sony was a rice cooking company. They made rice cookers at first. So they pivoted. But with Yokoi, he would take outdated technology and create something that was a game, playing cards are a game, right? But you'd take an outdated technology and make a game out of it, make something that was innovative and fun and use the lateral thinking that he had from playing cards, from working in technology in college, and then make something fun out of it. So the technology that went into the first Game Boy was well out of date. It was the same technology in a Casio calculator, right? And it, it, now they were doing these Everybody was so focused on color and making, um, you know, PlayStation and all these different things. And he just took the same existing technology that was at a fraction of the cost and went and made Game Boy for Nintendo, right? And it, it's just that lateral thinking of taking opportunities that are in front of them, things that they don't necessarily think are opportunities and making the most out of it, changing the way he thought about it to create a new opportunity. And if you think that opportunities aren't out there for you to, get that job, to move into commercial, to do something different. They're, they're staring at you in the face, but you just have to think about them differently. And you have to look at, oppor at the opportunities in a different way um, and start to create your own opportunities, really. So that's one of the lies. Next lie, I don't have the money. You ever heard that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the, the, a great story with this is the Wright Brothers. Start with why Simon Sinek talks yeah. about this a lot, but there's Samuel Pierpont Langley, commissioned by the U.S. government, I believe. Uh, he was a pro professor of engineering at Princeton, and he was commissioned, given he's a pretty boy, yeah, all the money in the world to build a flying machine. Mm -hmm. And the Wright brothers are in Ohio with Bis their bicycle shop, their bicycle shop, and that's what funded their experiments in the field uh, to go and fly, build a flying machine. And they would actually take multiple parts with them because they knew they were going to crash and they'd have to fix something that they do, They knew failure was going to happen. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had access to all of the greatest minds in the world in the Ivy League and from around the world to build this flying machine. And the Wright brothers were just experimenting and had a passion for it. And they didn't have a ton of money, but they ran their bike shop and on the side they were doing this flying thing and now everybody knows who the Wright brothers are because they were the first ones to fly. They're on a quarter in the United States, right? Yep. And it, it just goes to show that it's not about the money. It's, it's if you have the passion to do it, and if you have the desire to, you know, it's the change formula again. If you have that desire to do something incredible, then you can do it. Yeah, Adam Smith, the original Adam Smith, 1776 Wealth of Nations guy said uh, mm talks about people complain there's not capital available <laughs> uh, if there's a good idea there seems to be abundant capital absolutely <laughs> so if you have a good idea and you want to do it you can find the money if that's the pre or find a way to do it without all the money what's your uh bucket in the ocean oh you can go to the ocean well that's uh dan kennedy yeah. says you can go to the ocean with a bucket or a teaspoon ocean doesn't care <laughs> <laughs> it's all about your attitude and neither should the other people on the beach care either. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a really good point. The next lie that people tell themselves about changing the reality is that it's too hard. Um, and hard is very subjective. It's not objective. But the reality is that you can't grow 
without being uncomfortable, without doing hard things. Anything worth doing is going to be hard. But if you're going to grow, then there's a formula for that too. The growth formula is pain plus rest equals growth. If I'm going to get stronger, I'm going to have to go through some pain in the gym. My muscles are going to have to be tear torn down by me doing reps. And then I'm going to have to rest a little bit from that. And then I'll actually get stronger. It's no different. You're going to have hard things. Go and do them and then rest. Reflect on it. What did we learn? What can we pivot from this experience? How can we grow? And eventually you will grow. You'll become better. Your reality will change from that hard thing. Um, next one is I need a plan. That's a huge lie that I, they want everything to be super clear. And stop worrying about the details. Just get started. Just do something. Act. Act as if. And if, you, if you'll get acted, then things will change. You start acting. A, a big one, this also comes from range, but people like to think that, you know, they need this plan and they can env even envision what the plan is loosely of, oh, we're going to do this step and then this will happen and then this will happen and it's very linear. And you don't, you don't need a, a plan. I agree with that, but you do need a direction. <laughs> yeah. When you get up in the morning, am I going to point my feet to the north, east, north south star. or west? Yeah. You and star. so you, you, you need an idea of what you're trying to do. Absolutely. But you're right. Yeah. There, there's an old saying in pro formas, which are uh, financials going forward. Yeah. Uh, the foolishness of carrying four assumptions to four decimal places. Say that again. Okay. So I've got my sales forecast for okay. four years from now, <laughs> and it's $22,555.44. You know, it, it's just that it's ridiculous yeah. <laughs> to carry four assumptions, meaning, oh, I think I'll sell them. I think I'll get this market, and I think yeah. I can produce them for this, and I think I can deliver this many. That's four assumptions because you don't know. Yeah, but anyway, that's that's a joke among uh, people doing startups and so on. It's it's also a little bit dishonest to yourself and others mm -hmm. because it implies a level of certainty that's not there. Absolutely, you know. So, but you do need you need an idea, a direction. You need but an idea, you, direction. It's but analysis paralysis to sit down and say oh, I have to have a detailed plan that I can execute one, two, three, four, five, because that's not what's going to happen. Yeah. Here, here's the thing I say about the plans and budgets is the only thing certain of every plan and every budget ever done is that they are wrong. They will change. They are wrong. Yep. And I don't remember some general said, or somebody, some old guy, yeah. dead, dead guy said, every plan is perfect until you present, every plan of battle is perfect until you present it to the enemy. <laughs> and so anyway, that's, that's, yeah, that's a good point. You have to, uh, you have to get started. You need a direction, but don't bog down the details because that's not what's going to happen. I mean, if you, Going back to the, the range book, he talks about how like we think that our future is going to be this linear path that we're going to follow. And it's going to be this, and then this will happen, and then we'll do that, and then this is going to come into place, and we'll get to that point. And it's this linear path going forward. But if you look at your past, it's, it, it was all over way. the place. Yeah. You were up and down, over to the side, pivoting here, going up and down there. And we're all works in progress claiming to be finished products, wanting to be finished products. And that's not the reality. We were works in progress back there. We're going to continue to be works in progress going forward. You can go and make this super detailed plan, but it's way better if you can just get started with a, with a direction. Just get started, do something. Don't worry about the details. Figure it out as you go. Um, next lie is that things are just going to keep getting in the way. It's just one well, thing that's not a lie. Next. They are going to keep getting in the way. But it shouldn't stop you from changing your reality. No. No, I'm kidding. There's a, I don't know, Confucius, Buddha, somebody <laughs> said the obstacle is the way. Mm. And it's so true. We have a mutual client, Lance, I can use his name. He, and he does some sophisticated stuff and he laughs because he talks to the clients and they said, look, I've got to fix this problem. I'm willing to do anything except that. What do you suppose the problem is every time? It's that. It's that thing they don't want to do because fill in the blank. It's too complex, too expensive. But it's the obstacle is the way. And it just almost, it, it, that's why that comes down from whoever it was, Buddha or, yep. it's because it's true. Yep. So where's the obstacle? Pull right through it because that's where the problem, find your way around. But it's, the obstacle is the way. Yeah. 
I think another good saying with this is just if you can't control it, then don't worry about it. Yeah. You know, there's going to be events that happen, but if you can control it, then go and fix it. You know, and I think there's, there's a really good Ray Lewis uh, speech that he has about detours versus distractions in his life. How he, at 24, he decided to just let go of going to the club and drinking and drugs and all those different things because they were distractions, but that things would still come up and he would see them as detours. Uh, you know, he used to rely on his speed in his game mm -hmm. and he had to have nine, nine surgeries over his career and he would see it as a detour to rely more on his mind. And he became one of the smartest linebackers in the NFL. Same thing's going to happen in your business. You're going to have distractions that you have to let go of, right? You don't need the brand new trucks just to do the job, right? You can get the used ones. Um, but you're also going to have detours, things like coronavirus. And those can be some of the biggest opportunities for you where you can become the best business in town because of that detour that you think was, oh man, but we were on this clear path. Well, and then it changed. If you really dig into it, you can maybe make something new for yourself and for your company uh, that, that can change the reality in a really good way. Don't always see it as a negative. Another one is uh, that it's too risky to change the reality, right? We're, we're in the, it's, it's too much risk to change, to, to pivot into this service now or to uh, you know, upgrade all of this stuff in our business. And you have to be creative with fear. One of my favorite um, stories is of, Yos of uh, not Yosemite, Yellowstone, where they, they eradicated all the wolves from- Oh yeah from uh, Yellowstone and it completely changed the no environment. idea of the uh, environmental impact of it that completely changed it like so the wolves were gone so now all the grazing animals like elk and deer uh, had no predators and so now they can they used to have to go into the mountains at certain times of the day to avoid the wolves and then they would come down to the streams uh, whenever the wolves weren't there so they could have water but now they would just stay at the stream yeah, and the erosion and and then they're trampling along the path of the stream and it dampens the soil uh, and it makes the soil really soft. So now the rivers aren't flowing as strong because they can disperse out over the soil. And so because the rivers aren't flowing as strong, the beavers leave and fish aren't able to travel through Yellowstone. I mean, the ecology completely changes. And then the the, the grazing animals are now also eating these sapling trees. And so now there's not enough trees for the birds to for the canopy for the birds to lay eggs and have their nests and so everything changes over the course of decades and in the 90s i think they decided to bring wolves back they said we don't we just eradicated these we don't know you know what the impact was let's just bring them back and see what happens and almost immediately within a few years everything changes immediately the the grazing animals go back into the mountains and have more of a migration pattern and the, the fish come back, the beavers come back, the birds come back. I mean, everything changes and it's for the better. Um, Yellowstone is actually growing and becoming a better ecological system now. Um, and I think so many people are worried about risk, worried about the fears they have. And fear is a good thing uh, if you let it be. Yeah, fear can cripple you. But if, you be, if you're if you creative with fear and how you respond to fear and you look for solutions rather than just trying to avoid it, you'll actually have a better business in the long run because you understand the risks and you've found solutions to those risks, not just avoidance to them. Yeah. Uh, fear and worry. Um, Mark Twain says are a misuse of imagination. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's an acronym out there, fear, F E A R, um, false expectations appearing real. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that there isn't risk, but there's risk in inaction. There's Absolutely. risk in action, but nobody I had a guy call me last night. Well, I won't go into it, but he's taking a huge gamble. Yeah. He was calling me gulp. And I want to know what I think of that. And I said, well, you already did it, right? He said, yeah. Well, then I think it's a good idea because <laughs> you already did it. And you know what? Maybe it fails. Yeah. And what's the worst that's going to happen? This guy is not going to fail, actually. Yeah. But it's a three and a half million dollar deal. He goes, man, I don't know. Said, well, <laughs> well, you already did it, right? Yeah. Good for you. Yeah, <laughs> I said that's where I come in and say, hey, "You loser! That's the stupidest thing I ever heard of." That would have made him feel good. Yeah, for sure. So there's there's a lot of lies that people believe about changing reality. I've got one more that I want to talk about. Um, is that I've tried and it doesn't work. 
They tried it and they give up. And I think, you know, we can point back to some of our episodes like Sergio where, yeah, he tried, but he was just doing everything wrong and he almost gave up, but he changed his reality um, and it changed his business. And he's, I mean, he's doing incredible now. Um, so you can go back and listen to that episode if you want. But I, I think a big thing to realize is to not dig up your seeds. Um, it's a, it's a good quote by Steve Bartlett. I don't know if he's the one that came up with it, but he's the one that showed it to me. Um, but you wouldn't go and plant seeds and then in three days, just dig up everything and check and see if they're growing. Like, no, right. you're, you're, you're working on change. Let them work. Let them work. Let them grow. Let the seeds grow. And don't question everything that you've been working on after just a couple months of putting it into action. Give it time. Have patience. Keep watering your seeds. Keep giving them sunlight, right? Keep doing the things that are necessary so that you can reach your ultimate vision. Um, so lots of different lies that people believe about changing their reality. And uh, I, I think that for the most part, I would boil it down to act you know, be, find what needs to be changed and act on it. Um, so I, I know that you want to go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say, I think the steps, um, except decide and act is where it starts. Yeah. I think you do need to have a conscious, um, change formula. You need to know what you're trying to get away from mm -hmm. and what you want to get toward. Um, the reality with the things that you can do to change your reality that we talked about, your beliefs, actions, and behavior are are your reality, but yeah. you can work on skills, beliefs, values, identity, and environment. Um, and so it's being aware of those things and just not settling. And you can be listening right now and you don't have a compelling vision or you're not really suffering and maybe you want to change anyway. There are people who want to change, you know, mm -hmm. if it ain't broke, break it. Yeah. That's the old, uh, old counter to if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. but other people say no break it. So there are people like that, but a lot of people aren't. But if you think about what you want, take the lid off, uh, say, I could have a better life if I wanted to. I'm not restricted because my parents didn't go to college and I didn't go to college. No. Uh, look at it and then walk through those steps. But you're right. Decide, except decide and act is where, where it all starts. Nothing happens unless you act. Yeah. So absolutely. The, uh, the one thing uh, that we always talk about is to act. What one thing could you do today? Yeah. What one thing is most important that you begin? Because you can't act unless you have something you're going to act on. Mm -hmm. So it can be up to people, but it could be deciding and identifying your pain or pleasure. It could be finding a skill that you want to be better at and making a list and a commitment on every Friday afternoon for one hour, you're going to listen to YouTube or webinars or right. read a book or read an ebook, um, listen to an audible book to get improved in that one area. I mean, something like that, but there has to be your one thing. We've talked about the tyranny of the urgent. There, there are always things everybody has to do all the time. I got to be here. I got to talk to that customer. I got to go chase this money down. I got to make a deposit, got, whatever it is. But there needs to be a time every week um, that you have dedicated to looking to the future. Yeah. And mark off that time and then decide what your one thing is and go start on it. Yeah, I think a lot of people are aware of what that one thing would be that would change their reality. Yeah. Um, they're thinking about it every single day. They've got negative thoughts about it. Just like you said, the, the one obstacle, right. You know, you, you the probably are aware of the what it is yeah. and you just need to go do something about it. So, um, let that be your one thing from this episode. We've covered a lot here on how to change your reality. Our first really behavioral topic. Right. Um, so there's plenty stuff. of resources that we mentioned. They're going to be in the show notes. Uh, so, so go and check those out. out. Let us know what your thoughts are. If you like topics like this if you want us to cover more in depth uh we'd absolutely love to and yeah give us a follow on social media we're on instagram twitter facebook linkedin uh go and follow us share us with your friends other contractors we'd love to grow this and Can't ask us questions support. yeah uh, we would love to hear very specific or very general questions that we can respond to and help with absolutely absolutely well martin thanks yes sir appreciate it See you next time. Okay.
Thanks for listening to The Cash Flow Contractor. Check out our website in the show notes or visit thecashflowcontractor.com.